Okay, it's 9 a.m. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Bui, co-director of the BHK Center's Coordination Center. And today we're continuing Section 4 on Data Modeling and Inference Methods. So, one of the more intriguing and powerful techniques that open up to us to big data science is, is discovery and testing of causal mechanisms. So, rather than simply looking for statistical correlations in the data, the objective is to find more definitive mechanistic relationships uh, from the data. And as you can imagine, this is a tricky and complex area of research. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Joseph Hogan, a professor of biostatistics and of public health at Brown University, where he's also the deputy director of the Data Science Initiative at Brown. His research interests include the development of statistical methods for missing data, causal inference, and sensitivity analysis, particularly in the areas of, around applications in HIV, HIV and behavioral sciences. His recent work includes HIV studies in the regions of Kenya and the Sub-Saharan Africa. He'll be talking about causal inference methods today. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Hogan. Joe, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Okay, Alex, thanks so much. Um, first, I guess I should just check to see if you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, well, I'd like to thank um, uh, Michelle Dunn, uh, who is um, no longer at NIH, but who's the one who invited me to give this talk. And I'd like to thank the NIH for sponsoring these lectures. I've watched a couple of them. They're really great, and uh, I expect them are going to be I expect they're going to be a terrific resource for people as they navigate this new terrain of data science. So on this slide here, um, I'm just going to outline the goals of the causal inference presentation. The, um, the talk will be mostly conceptual. Uh, I'll try to avoid technicalities. And really, the idea is to give a flavor for causal thinking in observational studies and how to think about and adjust for confounding whether it's measured or unmeasured. So first, I'll uh, talk about simple types of causal questions using um, actually a very old clinical trial that's, that gave rise to a lot of causal inference research in the 90s, uh, the uh, clofibrate randomized trial. Uh, next, um, formalize ways to think about causal effects in terms of potential outcomes. And then using another simple example, I'll illustrate some statistical methods for inferring treatment effect. And I think this might be helpful for the audience because <clears throat> there are a lot of statistical techniques and I think when they're illustrated on a simple case, uh, the essence of them becomes clear, although their application in more complex settings obviously demands more than what can be covered in this lecture. After that, I'll discuss some more complicated problems. Uh, I'm going to focus on unmeasured confounding and mediation. And then I'll just indicate some open questions and big data problems in causal inference. So I want to start with a disclaimer. Um, first, causal inference is, is just too big for a one-hour webinar. Uh, here at Brown, we teach an entire semester class on causal inference. Um, if you were to open most journals in statistics or biostatistics, you'll see at least one and probably more articles on causal inference. And it's a field that's central to scientific discovery, and it's growing all the time. The examples that I'm going to use here reflect uh, my own uses of causal inference methods in applied problems. So I'm not going to attempt to be comprehensive. And in fact, I'm going to leave out some very important issues uh, or just briefly mention them, uh, such as instrumental variables, which I'll touch on a little bit when I talk about Mendelian randomization. But uh, graphical models is something that uh, is extremely important to causal inference and highly well-developed, but I won't have time to cover here. And I just want to say that the omission of these topics is really just a function of having limited time, and it's not to reflect whether or not these issues are important in the area of causal inference. So causality, <coughs> causality and causal inference uh, these are fundamental. These are fundamental topics in science, and researchers in many many fields have contributed 
not only to thinking about what makes a causal relationship causal, but also how to infer causal relationships from observed data. And this is just an incomplete listing, and you can see there's a wide variety of different disciplines where causal inference has, has played a, a significant role. So I thought a little bit about what it means to say causal inference, or what do we mean by causal inference? And uh, there, are, there are some different definitions out there. If you open causal inference books, you might see it described in different ways. But the way I think about it is it's a process of using observed data to infer a causal relationship based on a known or hypothesized mechanism or model. And that could be a physical model, or it could be a hypothesized mechanism that we're using data to test out. There's also um, a field, especially, uh, there, there's, a, there's a field of research, especially in um, computer science and artificial intelligence, concerned with discovering causal structure from data from a, on a purely empirical basis. But the focus here is going to be on inferring causal relationships based on known or hypothesized mechanisms or models. And there's a vast literature, as I mentioned, on frameworks for causal inference, technical approaches, methods for drawing inference, and so forth. So <clears throat> here I'm just going to show uh, covers of some books that have been published. I think most of these have been published in the last 10 years, um, if not all of them. And it's just really to indicate the vast sweep of thinking on causal inference. Uh, and also to indicate some of the leaders in this area. So these books are presented in no particular order, but the first is um, a new book by Guido Imbens and Don Rubin on causal inference in statistics and social sciences uh, and in biomedical sciences. In that book, you'll find a detailed description of potential outcomes, uh, instrumental variables, and related techniques. Uh, this book, Causality, by Judea Pearl, uh, is considered by now a seminal text um, and lays out the so-called do calculus and graphical models for causal reasoning and causal inference. These two books, um, the one on the left is a little bit blurry, but it's the, I think it's the design of a cover for a, a book that's forthcoming by Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins. Um, next is a book on observational studies by Paul Rosenbaum, who's at UPenn. And then here are two new books um, that just arrived on my desk, uh, Explanation Causal Inference, which is a book on, uh, that focuses on mediation and longitudinal causal processes by Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard. And I would say Tyler is the leading authority in, in this area of work. And uh, a book that I found extremely useful for teaching and that provides really a comprehensive coverage of a, ver a variety of different techniques. Uh, which is Counterfactuals and Causal Inference by Morgan and Winship. And uh, that book just came out with a second edition that's significantly expanded beyond the first. And um, I guess all these books would be good starting points um, if, if one wanted to learn about uh, or wanted to start to dive into the world of causal inference. But my personal bias and a recommendation I make to students is to start with the Morgan and Winship book. Um, if you have some background in statistics, and um, some experience with, with uh, regression and, and data analysis. So for the first part here is um, concerns formalizing a uh, causal question. And <clears throat> I'm just going to walk through some data from um, a clinical trial of clofibrate for reducing mortality in um, older patients with heart disease. And so this trial, um, I, and by the way, I'll give citations to the different uh, papers that I cite, usually with a short reference like I'm giving here. So hopefully that will give you enough to look up the paper and learn some of the background. So if you look at this table, um, <clears throat> this is a table from a clinical trial uh, that enrolled about 3,700 uh, individuals. And the way to read this is, um, if you look at the top row, uh, you'll see treatment group, you'll see clofibrate and placebo. And then the clofibrate arm, if you look to the bottom, to the bottom uh, row, you'll see that there were 1,065 randomized to clofibrate. The mortality rate was about 18.2%. 
the five-year mortality rate. And if you look at the placebo column and you go to the bottom row, you'll see there were two, 2,695 uh, randomized to placebo and the mortality rate was about 19%. Now what this table also does is it subdivides these groups into those who were considered adherent with the treatment and uh, non-adherent, where adherence is defined as taking the medicine as prescribed uh, more than 80% of the time. And so just to see how to read this, you'll see that, for example, the row that says less than 80% uh, in the clofibrate arm, 357 patients were not compliant, and the mortality rate in that group was 24%. Uh, in the placebo arm, which had a, um, a simulated version of the drug so that it looked like you were taking clofibrate, uh, 882 were not compliant. Uh, the mortality rate there was 28%. And then in the compliant or adherent groups, it was 15% um, mortality rate in each. So that's how to decompose this table. But even in a simple table like this, um, we can frame at least three different causal questions. And so this, this really goes to the first part of the talk, which is how do we think about causal effects? A, a generic way to ask the question is, well, what is the effect of clofibrate? But the starting point for causal inference demands that the question be framed in, in more specific terms than that. So here are three examples. Um, the first example is kind of like a policy question or a question about uh, public health practice or general treatment um, of heart disease. And so the question, is that the, the premise is that doctors are gonna prescribe clofibrate. Uh, will it reduce mortality? And there, we're asking, what is the causal effect of being randomized to clofibrate? That's how we can answer that question with these data. The second question is different, though. If you think about it, it's more at the individual level. And sometimes this is a question that we might have if we go to the doctor. Uh, my doctor gave me clofibrate. If I take it, will it reduce my chances of early mortality? And so here, we're talking about the causal effect of actually taking clofibrate rather than just being randomized. We might also know that, well, there's a, there's a group of, of patients who elected to take the drug, and we might ask the question if they're better off, if they, if they derive benefit from taking the drug relative to not taking it. So we could ask, uh, what is the causal effect of taking clofibrate, but just among the subgroup of individuals who took the drug? So we'll take these one at a time. and. We'll look at how the data can be used to either answer these questions or uh, maybe to gain some intuition but not really formally answer the questions. So the first is um, the question about uh, overall prescribing patterns. So we can ask, we can ask a question about uh, if, doctors, if doctors prescribe clofibrate, will it reduce mortality? And this is the kind of question um, that goes to general practice patterns. So should, should clofibrate be prescribed for these sorts of patients as a group? So the, to, to pin down the answer, we can frame it as um, the causal effect of being randomized to clofibrate. We, we have the answer to that question right here um, in this trial because we have one group of patients who was prescribed clofibrate by virtue of being randomized to that arm, and the second group that was uh, not prescribed clofibrate. And if we look at the if we look at the difference, we see the mortality rates are very similar. There's not really much of a reduction in mortality, maybe about a 1.2 absolute uh, percentage reduction. The next question has to do with the individual. So my doctor gave me clofibrate. Um, if I take it, will it reduce my chances of early mortality? Now, that this question is a little more complicated to answer, and it's not entirely clear how we would answer it from the data that are presented. So our intuition might be to focus on just the patients that were randomized to the clofibrate arm. And what we see is that among those who took the drug, the mortality rate was 15%, but there was a substantial number of individuals who didn't take the drug, and the mortality rate there was uh, 24%. So just by virtue of numbers, we might think we can get a comparison. But there's nothing that tells us that these groups are similar on, 
other characteristics that might be related to mortality. And in fact, if we look at the next um, column in the placebo arm, we'll see that those who complied with placebo also had a lower mortality rate than those who didn't comply. So we're not going to go and try to untangle this right here, but this is just an illustration of the fact that we can't simply use a two-group comparison even within this randomized trial to answer the question of whether taking clofibrate is going to have a causal effect on mortality. Now another question is, some people took clofibrate and some didn't. Uh, among those who took it, did it reduce early mortality? Well here, we see there's only one group of individuals that took clofibrate. And the other difficulty is that it would be, it'd be hard, it, if not, it's not obvious at least, to find the control group that would correspond to this um, group that's circled in red in order for us to make this causal comparison. So the takeaways from this are that um, first we need to be precise about our target of inference and just by asking the questions the way we did, we can be precise about what we're interested in. But looking at the observed data may not lead to intuitive or correct answers. And in particular, we can't just compare, for example, those who complied with the drug versus those who didn't to try to address a causal question. And so that, that gives rise to the need for a causal framework for uh, representing causal effects and then um, using those representations to, uh, mapping those representations to observe data to try to draw inference about causal effects. So the framework I'm going to describe here is a potential outcomes framework. Um, it's a formal way to represent causal effects. It's due to uh, Don Rubin, uh, who wrote about potential outcomes in a 1974 paper in the educational psychology literature. The um, potential outcomes really, the, the one reason I like to use them is that um, they expose what, what's known as the fundamental problem of causal inference, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, potential outcomes can also help us understand how to adjust for confounding and we can frame confounding as a selection problem which which leads to um, which naturally leads to some of the more common methods for confounder adjustment and so after we uh, after we lay out the potential outcomes framework um, I'll walk through some statistical methods for confounder adjustment in a simple example really for the purpose of contrasting how they work So the potential outcomes framework for defining causal effects can be um, described pretty easily in the case of binary treatment. Um, for a binary treatment, we have um, the label A is equal to one if a person is exposed and zero if not. And this is not a random variable, it's just a, a label. And so the, the potential outcomes framework assumes that each person has two potential outcomes in this setting, uh, why one if the person has been exposed, and Y0 if not. So in this simple setting, we can define causal effects in terms of potential outcomes. At the individual level, we can define a contrast of potential outcomes to be our causal effect, simply Y1 minus Y0. At the population level, we can take an average over a population of interest. So we can take the average difference between Y1 and Y0. And we can also define causal effects within subgroups. So for example, we could look at the causal effect within women. Uh, we could look at the causal effect among people who took a treatment, for example. Um, differences in potential outcomes are not the only way potential uh, that causal effects can be defined. They can also be defined in terms of ratios or other functions of Y1 and Y0. So the fundamental problem of causal inference <clears throat> is that the potential outcomes can never be fully observed. And this is actually what leads to the term counterfactual. With a binary treatment, 
uh, in this case, only one of the potential outcomes is observed and the one that's not observed is counterfactual. So let's just look at a simple example. I do a lot of work in HIV and so this hypothetical example will just look at setting up potential outcomes for examining the effect of HIV treatment on survival. So we're going to define little a to be the treatment label, 1 or 0, and this would be a scenario that upon presentation with HIV, an individual either receives antiretroviral therapy or ART uh, or does not. And so for this individual, the potential outcomes are uh, Y0 and Y1, where Y0 is a survival time under the scenario that the person does not receive treatment, and Y1 is the survival time under the scenario that the person does receive treatment. And the causal effect of receiving ART is the contrast of these two. Now the way potential outcomes relate to observed data is as follows. If you uh, remember the treatment label is little a, either one or zero, but the actual treatment received, the random variable we're going to denote with capital A. So capital A is one if the individual actually received the treatment and zero if not. So the observed outcome is either going to be Y1 or Y0, depending on whether treatment was received or not. And I'll walk you through a simple example to show that um, the, the expression on the left, which is the average outcome for people who received the treatment minus the average outcome for people who did not receive the treatment, um, is not the same as a contrast in the average of the potential outcomes. So this expression at the bottom is a compact way of saying that um, causation is not association. So here's a hypothetical example and for those who have uh, read introductory books on causal inference this might look familiar. So what I've done is I've written down uh, hypothetical data, data that we can't see uh, for seven individuals. And I just want to write down the underlying potential outcomes for these seven individuals. So what you'll see is for person one, uh, we have Y1 and Y0. Y0 is 300, which means that if person one had not received treatment, they would survive for 300 days. And if they did receive treatment, they would survive for 500 days. So the causal effect of receiving treatment for person one is 200. Likewise, if we go down the list for person two, if they receive treatment, they would survive for 900 days. If they don't receive treatment, they would only survive for 200 days. So the causal effect is to increase their survival by 700 days. If we tally the averages for Y0 and Y1, we see that average survival on treatment is 843. That's the average survival under the scenario that everybody receives treatment. And the average survival under the scenario that nobody receives treatment is 529. So the causal effect of treating everyone versus treating no one is 314. Now, this next table shows an allocation of treatment as individuals present with HIV. So what this table shows is that the first four individuals will receive treatment and the next three will not receive treatment. So for those who receive treatment, the first four individuals, the outcome we get to see is Y1. And for the next three individuals who did not receive treatment, the outcome we get to see is Y0. So the observed data are in the last column, the Y variable. So if we look at the association between those who receive treatment 
uh, I'm sorry, if we look at the association between treatment and outcome, we can start by taking the average of Y for those who received the treatment, and that's 600. And we can take the average of Y for those who did not receive treatment, and we see that that's 867. So the difference in these two averages is what I'm calling the predictive effect. Um, and what I mean by that is <clears throat> that we could use the indicator of whether a person received treatment to predict their survival. So in other words, um, if we look at the predictive effect as the difference in Y between those who received and did not receive treatment, we see that those who actually did receive treatment survived for 267 days less on average. So receiving treatment actually has a negative predictive effect on survival. But that's not the same as the causal effect. The causal effect is the difference in the potential outcomes, which as we saw previously, is to increase survival by 314 days. So this, this discrepancy raises the question of how can we use statistical methods and, and observational data to handle um, this phenomenon. And if I just go back one slide, um, the discrepancy here between the predictive effect and the causal effect uh, could potentially be explained by what are called confounding variables. So now we'll expand the inference problem to include other characteristics that may be observed on the individual. So the observed data for an individual will say are uh, given by A, Y, and X, and these are random variables, and we say that uh, A is 1 if the treatment is received and 0 if not. We see that Y is going to be either Y1 or Y0, depending on whether treatment is received, and X is a set of measured covariates. And so the question is, how do we use a sample of observed data of this form to draw inference about um, an average treatment effect? So one data example I can use to illustrate this is the HIV Epidemiology Research Study, or the HER study. Um, it's a study, it's a cohort study of HIV in women that um, took place early in the epidemic in the 1990s. And what this table shows is a simple two-group comparison of those who uh, received therapy, uh, which is the A equals 1 column, and those who didn't, which is the A equals 0 column. And the outcome we're interested in looking at is CD4 uh, six months following uh, a, baseline, a baseline entry time. So the covariates that we can look at are baseline uh, the log viral load and higher is worse. Uh, we can look at baseline symptoms and higher is worse in that case and baseline CD4 uh, where higher is better. So what we see in the A equals one column is that the CD4 at six months was slightly higher than for A equals zero, but the covariates indicate that those who were uh, those who were less healthy are more likely to receive the treatment, and that's similar to the hypothetical data we saw on the previous slides. So just to show how the observed data relate to the potential outcomes and how the observed data are actually an incomplete representation of the information we need to draw causal effects, here are a couple of excerpts from the observed data. We can look at the control group and the first column is treatment. We see that all of them have A equals zero. Then X1, X2, X3 are the covariates. Y is the observed outcome, but the, the important columns to look at are uh, Y0 and Y1. So for the control group, we only get to observe Y0, and if we look at the treatment group, we only get to observe Y1. So in order to use observed confounders to make adjustments, we need to define a concept known as ignorable treatment assignment. Uh, treatment assignment is ignorable if we have some subset of the confounders 
such that we can say treatment is randomly allocated within distinct levels of the confounders. So we have to be able to find subsets of individuals that are the same on their X values, but different on their treatment values. And we have to make the assumption that the difference in the treatment values is unrelated to the potential outcomes. If this condition doesn't hold, then we have a problem known as unmeasured confounding. Now an important uh, summary, an important, um, an important uh, summary of the confounding information and in causal inference is the propensity score. The propensity score is a summary measure that represents the probability of receiving treatment conditional on covariates. And a key result um, in brief is that um, if treatment is um, ignorable conditional on the covariates X, and if the propensity score is bounded between zero and one, which means that every distinct X value has some probability of receiving treatment, then we can say treatment is also ignorable conditional on the propensity score. So a way to say this in plain English is that um, we can uh, just condition on the propensity score to do causal inference rather than conditioning on all of the covariates at once. Now there's several important consequences to, um, to, this, to this finding. Uh, propensity scores can be used for confounder adjustment in a number of ways. Um, one very popular way of using propensity scores is as uh, to do inverse probability weighting. And in this case, um, each observation is weighted by the inverse probability of the treatment that that person received. So in a sense, it's correcting a non-random treatment allocation problem. And when you have a weighted sample, you can then go ahead and apply uh, standard techniques to, to infer the treatment effect. Uh, so more details about this are in the book I mentioned before by Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins, and I've given the link there. Uh, matching is another technique that is important and useful for drawing causal effects based on propensity scores. And I'm going to talk a little bit about matching um, so that a couple of subtle issues will become uh, clear. Um, I found that in my own collaborations anecdotally that um, the use of propensity score for matching is something that generates um, a fair bit of, of confusion. So matching can be used to create match pairs or sets having similar propensity scores, but the confusion arises um, in some cases because in matching, uh, what we can do is we can create balanced groups in the sense that the confounder distributions are balanced between the treated and control groups. But matching on propensity scores is not the same as matching on individual uh, covariate values. And in particular, um, it's possible to have uh, individuals that have almost identical propensity scores but very different uh, covariate values. So matching is good for group level inference but not necessarily individual level inference. So in matching, um, the general idea is to refine matches by minimizing the distance between covariates, um, between the treated and control groups, or possibly um, the propensity scores. So there are lots of different metrics we can use for matching. Um, exact matching means that we'll declare a match only if the covariate values are exactly the same. And in practice, this tends to be a little bit difficult. Uh, there are also Euclidean distance measures or Mahalanobis distance measures uh, looking at the, the statistical distance between the covariates. And we can also use the propensity score as a distance measure. So one source of confusion with matching has to do with what quantity is being estimated. Um, there are two basic types of matching in the two sample problem, treatment group matching and full matching. So in treatment group matching, what we do is for each person in the treatment group, we find matches from the control group. 
And this actually estimates the average treatment effect among the treated, the reason being that we're sampling initially from the treatment group and then looking into the control group to find individual matches. In full matching, um, we don't first sample on the treatment group. What we do is uh, we just look across all possible pairs and find pairs or groups that are close on the matching criterion. And when we match using full matching, um, we'll be estimating the average treatment effect because we're not starting with the sample of treated individuals. And then there's a whole raft of algorithms that are designed to um, create, create optimal matches. Um, most of them are versions of minimizing the sum of the distance measure across the sample. So I've mentioned this already, but it's just important to keep in mind the question of matching versus balance. Um, matching on propensity scores does not imply matching on covariates. Um, and matching on propensity scores is not designed to create um, pairs that can be looked at individually. They're really designed to create a balanced distribution in two different groups that are being compared. So next I'll just show a brief illustration using the HERS data, just using two of the covariates, CD4 cell count and symptom score and enrollment. So these are just uh, excerpts from an analysis, but to give you an idea that, um, that these methods are relatively easy to apply. So first we can fit a propensity score model, and there's only two covariates here, so we're just gonna use the main effects, although I'm going to say a couple of things about situations, big data situations where we have um, many, many covariates, possibly even thousands of covariates. Um, after after fitting a propensity score model, um, we use the estimated propensity scores to find match pairs. And then a very important step is to look at um, the covariate distributions to ensure that there's some balance. And once you're confident that you have balanced covariates, actually the nice thing about matching is you can simply perform analyses uh, using standard methods like two sample comparisons or regression estimators. In some matching, setups, uh, you have to use weighted regression because of the, um, the unequal representation of groups in the match sets. So one consequence of, of some matching algorithms, um, depending again on how you set it up, is that you might be discarding a lot of your data. So here we started with 246 in the control group and 111 in the treated group this analysis is going to be estimating the average treatment effect among the treated. So we took the 111 treated individuals and matched them to 111 controls, which means that 135 were left out of the analysis. So there are a lot of empirical ways of looking at whether balance has been achieved. Um, in this case, if you look at the first column, uh, we see propensity scores for the treated and control groups, and those histograms don't look very similar. But in the second column, if we look at the matched individuals, the propensity score histograms are almost identical. And I think I'll skip this plot because I'm keeping an eye on the time and I wanna be able to mention a couple of uh, topics that are coming up. So to do um, analysis after the matching, um, we can do a simple two sample test. Uh, with this right here is the result of a t-test or a regression with just a binary covariate and we see that the causal effect is 27. But uh, most, most papers on matching recommend uh, also controlling for the covariates that have been matched on as a way of increasing efficiency and cleaning up any possible discrepancies. So here we see that um, the estimate is about the same, but if we just flip back, the standard error of the treatment effect was 22 um, without adjusting for covariates, and it's 12 after we do adjust for covariates. So there can be considerable efficiency gains by, uh, by adjusting for the covariates that were matched on. 
So another common technique um, for causal inference is extrapolation, and in, in some more complicated settings where the extrapolation takes place is known as a G-computation algorithm. And again, it's described in the book by Hernan and Robbins. And again, the idea is if we view, if we view causal inference through the lens of potential outcomes, um, the approach here becomes pretty transparent. We want to just, we basically want to impute the missing Y1 and Y0. So that can be done in this very simple case using really three steps. Um, we fit a regression model for Y given X in the treatment group, and that gives us a sense of prediction model for Y1. And we fit a regression of Y given X in the control arm, and that gives us essentially an imputation or prediction model for Y0. Uh, we then apply these prediction models to the entire sample to get a difference um, that represents the average treatment effect. So just to remind you, um, this was, these are excerpts from the observed data. What you'll notice is that the Y1 column is missing for the control group and the Y0 column is missing for the treatment group. But after the fitting of regression models and um, imputing the missing outcomes, what we get is for the control group, um, we have both Y0 and Y1. And despite this being the control group, we can use the predictions for Y0. Um, and in the treatment group, uh, we have Y0 and Y1. And so the causal inference is really a matter of just taking the average of the differences which appear in the last column. And so causal inference using the g-computation algorithm can be compared to um, the unadjusted estimate here. And what we see is that the unadjusted estimate showed about a 10% difference in CD4 counts, whereas applying the g-computation algorithm uh, boosted that to about 30. So just a couple of notes about um, how this may scale up to big data. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of people asking the question, does big data solve the problem of causal inference? Um, in the sense that, well, we might have tens or hundreds or thousands of confounders and we might have massive data sets. Uh, so an important component of what I just talked about in, in uh, whether using propensity scores or regression models is that these models have to be correctly specified. And with many, many confounders, um, it's frequently hard to know what the correct specification is. So this has given rise to a large body of work where machine learning techniques are used to fit these uh, sub-models. And um, we can also look at um, techniques which are robust to misspecification of either the treatment model or the outcome model. And a good starting point for learning about some of these models is in a, a book by Mark Vanderland and Sherry Rose known as Targeted Learning. Um, there's a really comprehensive uh, coverage of, of this approach um, in that book. Now what about um, <clears throat> confounder selection? This is another ongoing problem. Again, if there are thousands of confounders, uh, then picking the right ones um, may not be as simple as just fitting a propensity score model using variable selection techniques. Um, so here we need sort of a different kind of loss function because uh, we need to pick confounders that not just make the best prediction in the propensity score or the outcome, but that also satisfy the, um, as much as possible the, um, the treatment ignorability assumption. So inevitably in causal inference we're confronted with the problem of unmeasured confounding. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, this the conundrum of causal inference is that we never get to see the other potential outcome. And so it's not possible to test the no unmeasured confounding uh, null hypothesis. And so there's been a lot of recent interest focused on sensitivity analysis and quantification of this source of uncertainty. And I'll just briefly mention two. Um, one is a method where we can quantify the magnitude of potential biases. And the other is known as a tipping point analysis in which we figure out how much potential, how much unmeasured confounding does there have to be for my results to change. 
So it's often um, helpful to think about when when we need a sensitivity analysis. So here's a graphical model, a simple graphical model that shows some causal relationships. We see that um, A is treatment and we're interested in the causal relationship between A and Y. We see that um, X are the confounders, the observed confounders, and they might be related to both A and Y. And I'll skip ahead here to show that um, there may be unmeasured confounders that are also related to both A and Y, uh, and we need to adjust for the bias associated with those unmeasured confounders. And as I mentioned before, there's no way to know uh, whether unmeasured confounding exists, so we can sort of flip the question around and ask a question like, how strong does unmeasured confounding have to be in order to change the results of a significant finding? So what I'm going to show here is a simple version of um, what's called a tipping point analysis using the HERS data. And this is um, due to Paul Rosenbaum. And there's a, a really terrific review paper in Siskel Science that I've cited here that um, I recommend reading. And it has a lot of uh, a very good discussion uh, papers as well following it. So what Paul recommends is, is um, in the case of matched pairs, to think of there being an unmeasured confounder U that affects treatment assignment within the matched pair. And if we frame the unmeasured confounder as a binary variable that has odds ratio gamma, um, what this tells us is that within matched pairs based on X, um, the odds of receiving treatment is gamma times higher among those with uh, U equals one for the unmeasured confounder. And so this, this yields a sensitivity analysis um, that can be represented like on this, as in this table. So in the first column we have gamma, in the second column we have the estimated uh, causal effect, in the third column there's a p-value associated with the causal effect. And the one in red is the estimated causal effect. Uh, this is actually using a rank test, so it's, a, it's slightly different than what we've seen in previous slides, but the p-value is 0.002 indicating a significant causal effect of treatment. But the p-value switches to um, something greater than 0.05 when gamma is at 1.33. So what that says is that if there's an unmeasured confounder that changes the odds of receiving treatment by 30% or more, then this could turn our results um, from significant to, to non-significant. So another kind of approach is what's called a bias analysis, um, where we ask ourselves how sensitive are results to additional bias from unmeasured confounding. And the difference between this and the tipping point analysis is that the bias analysis is measured on the scale of the outcome. So I'll just show you an example from a paper by uh, Steve Cole and others. And um, this is also looking at treatment effects, looking at the effect of HIV treatment on um, CD4 cell count. And what we see in this table is, um, what I've circled in the first part of the table is an unadjusted effect computed from observed data, which is 21.5. And then an adjusted effect, which is adjusted for baseline confounders, and the adjusted effect is 71. So we see the same sort of phenomenon that I showed you in the HERS study. And the observed confounding bias is on the order of uh, 49.5, meaning that the treatment effect changed by 49 units after controlling for confounders. So the bias analysis then looks at um, looks at the the potential um, the potential for bias if there was additional unmeasured confounding. And so on the x-axis we see the degree of bias from unmeasured confounding, and on the y-axis what we see is how much our results would change. So if we look at the dashed line um, and we trace the x-axis from zero back to negative 50, we're, we would be looking at scenarios where uh, the observed covariates didn't tell us enough about the unmeasured confounding in the case where unmeasured confounding meant that sicker patients were more likely to be treated. So this could represent a scenario, for example, where doctors have access to information that's not recorded in the study and it leads them to treat their patients more, more um, preferentially when they're 
when they appear less healthy. So I know we're coming up against the um, the end of the time period. So what I would like to do is just I'll, I'll go through these slides and I've put some references in that I think will be um, helpful if you want to start to look into some of these issues. But I just want to touch on a few, um, I'll just mention a few topics that are really uh, quite active areas of causal inference, at least in health research. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, uh, but it's these are topics that I think um, uh, people are seeing as, as quite important. So mediation analysis is, um, is a is the is is a question that looks at modeling calling modeling causal processes over time, and this is a particularly uh, particularly popular in behavioral science where behavioral interventions um, themselves don't typically cause outcomes, but they typically act by changing intermediate uh, variables. So, for example, we might have a cognitive therapy intervention. Um, the intervention is not like a drug that acts on uh, uh, acts physically on an individual, but it works through intermediate variables to change a behavior. And mediation analysis is about number one, testing hypotheses about mediators, but number two, uh, discovering which variables from a list are potential mediating variables. So I'll skip a couple of these slides. Um, another really important topic is causal inference for networks. And the main problem here is that um, in the simple example I showed you, individuals are independent of each other. But in networks, for example, when we're studying the efficacy of a vaccine, um, <clears throat> the outcomes for individuals are not at all independent. Uh, so in the case of vaccines, it's kind of easy to see why. Um, if a person is vaccinated, they're less likely to transmit the disease um, to another person, whether they're vaccinated or not. And uh, these raise very thorny and complicated issues related to interference and, um, and network structure. And so I've just given a couple of references here to get you started. Um, brain network connectivity is another uh, very active area of research where researchers are trying to understand how um, signals pass through different regions of the brain and how those signals are processed. Uh, precision medicine is <clears throat> is an area that demands a lot of causal thinking. Um, it's easy to get confused in this case between causal and predictive inference um, because purely empirical approaches have a lot of pitfalls. And I think that what's emerging is a consensus that design trials are likely to generate the best primary evidence about um, precision medicine and, and personalized therapies. So I've given a couple of, again, a couple of um, references here to get you started. So one innovative use of instrumental variables, which I didn't mention much, is, is Mendelian randomization, where researchers use genetic mutations or variants to study causal effects of disease. Here's an example where sickle cell trait um, is a genetic trait uh, that's related to development of malaria. Um, and this can be used to study whether malaria affects um, stunt, affects growth in children. Um, I'll just refer you to this paper to learn more about it. But this is uh, this is becoming an emerging area of research in, in public health. So, <clears throat> um, I guess in summary, I would just like to say that causal inference is more than a set of fancy techniques, and I sometimes am. Um, I get worried that researchers just think of it as a, a, a cornucopia of different techniques. It's really a systematic way of thinking about a problem or question at hand. Um, and counterfactual thinking, to my mind at least, is is very important to, to at least framing causal effects or framing causal questions. And with big data, there's a big temptation, I think, to um, to be lured into the trap of discovering causal relationships on a purely empirical basis. I think of this as data first, science later, where we might turn loose some fancy analytic techniques on big data and then possibly retrofit scientific explanations. Um, with causal inference, I think that it's really important to have a careful formulation of a model first, that the science should come, should come first. And then the data, whether it's observed data, found data, or coming from an experiment, 
um, comes later. And um, the inference process and causal inference uh, focuses on the model, of course, but then what assumptions are testable, what assumptions are not testable, which is really just as important, and properly reflecting uncertainty from uh, both sampling variation and from, um, from untestable assumptions. So I'll stop there to um, take questions, and I'm sorry for going over by about five minutes. I can, uh, if needed, uh, stay on for a couple minutes longer. Oh, thanks for this great introduction to causal inference. So let's, we have a couple questions from our audience. Um, so first question is, um, if we want to infer causality in longitudinal data, can we apply the same types of analyses um, or approach that you've described in, in, in this uh, lecture? So obviously you've touched a little bit upon this, but could you elaborate further maybe on, on how longitudinal data um, analyses would be looked at in terms of causal analysis or inference? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, there's lots of versions of longitudinal, um, there's lots of versions of causal questions that apply to longitudinal data. Um, and I think uh, just thinking about it a little bit um, in real time here, I'm trying to organize it, but the I would organize it into settings where um, the treatment is uh, stochastic, meaning that it can change over time in response to an individual's evolving health history, um, and then cases where the treatment is static, meaning that it's a sign at the beginning and we look at longitudinal trajectories over time. Um, I think in the latter case, <clears throat> really any of the methods that I uh, described could be used. That is. Um, if, you're, if the treatment is static, meaning that it's assigned at a fixed point in time, um, then there's not, you don't have to model the stochastic nature necessarily of, of the treatment and its relation to outcomes. Um, but when the, when the treatment changes over time, um, then we're restricted in the, the, the types of methods we can use. And in particular, matching becomes much more difficult. Um, so the methods that I'm familiar with for dealing with uh, longitudinal treatments um, are inverse probability weighting and uh, the G computation algorithm, where basically the, you can just think of it as extrapolation. And, and the idea is that um, we have to fit two types of models in order to extract inference. One is we have to fit a model that um, tells us how the treatment is evolving in response to the subject's evolving history, and the other is um, how the outcome is evolving in response to treatment and prior history. So, so the model fitting techniques, um, of the, the, the inverse weighting technique and um, the extrapolation or G estimation techniques can be used in those settings. I guess setting aside techniques for a minute, um, something that I think is really important is that in longitudinal settings where the treatment can vary over time, this is where graphical models play a really important role. Um, and I, I, I regret that I didn't have a lot of time to, to go into those, but the recommendation I would make is to, um, is to look into the, the literature on graphical models because they, they give us a starting point and they tell us like what assumptions are needed before we start fitting models and using analytic techniques. So uh, Judea Pearl has a really nice review um, that I could pass along if there's a way. It's, I think it's in um, Health Services Outcomes Research Journal. Um, it's called uh, Causality for Health Sciences, I believe. And Thomas Richardson and Jamie Robbins have, uh, have developed, um, have, have worked extensively in this area uh, developing graphical models for complex longitudinal processes. Great. So another question that we have, and we're actually getting quite a few from, from, the, from the audience. Okay. Um, so using your first example, is it fair to say that causal inference is useful in clinical trials to potentially detect uh, potential biases in the randomiz randomization process because randomization may not be fully random um, or as expected? Right. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. That's you know, I'm I'm not a clinical trials expert, so I don't want to go too far on a limb here. Um, 
but I think that uh, most randomized trials that I've been involved in, um, even if there's small discrepancies in the randomization, they don't turn into significant problems. Um, typically, if there's problems with imbalance, um, it's more a function of the trial execution. Uh, and I guess if there are really severe problems in the differences between um, groups at baseline, the randomized trial would almost have to be treated as an observational study. So if I'm understanding the question right, um, causal inference methods could be used to correct significant discrepancies um, between the groups. Um, but I suspect in, in most trials, those discrepancies are not going to um, be terribly substantial. Okay, and last question, because we're almost out of time. Um, can you touch briefly upon how matching and covariates are parameterized? Sort of an open-ended question there, I think. But, uh, Wait, I, I didn't catch that, that question. Can you just... Uh... Can you talk about how matching and covariates are parameterized? How matching and covariates are parameterized? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, if it's, it, maybe the question has to do with how the distances are measured. I mean, uh, that or propensity matching. Not sure. Okay. Um, Alex, I'm sorry to punt on this because I, I, I don't quite understand the question. If the if okay. the audience member wants to send me an email, I'd be happy to try to grapple with it a little bit more. My email's in the on the bottom left of the slide. And in fact, okay. I'm, no, that, I'm open to fine. having a. Uh, other audience members send me emails with questions. Okay, um, and actually the, the uh, audience member just said she will do that, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, so again, thank you so much for your time and, and, and this great talk, um, and we'll end it here. Okay, thank you, Alex, and thank okay. you for everybody who tuned in. I really appreciate your time.